Good morning, church family. We're glad that you have decided to take this opportunity to worship with us this morning. As a body here at Pickerington, we're glad that we can serve you by providing this online worship service. And even though we're beginning to meet together in our regular worship assembly here in the church building, we're gonna to continue to provide these worship services online for those of you who still have a need to um, use them in the comfort of your home or wherever you may be. As we prepare to enter into our worship service this morning, this will be a good opportunity to press pause, to take a moment, and reflect and see, are there, is there anything that you may need to do before we start this worship? Do you need to grab your Bible? Do you need to grab a notebook, a pen? Um, is there any distractions around you that you might need to um, stop so that you can be fully invested and tuned in um, to worshiping God in spirit and in truth? So just take a moment, take a deep breath, and let's focus our attention and our heart and our mind on God and the thing that we're about to do in entering into this worship. Before we begin, I'd like to share a verse with you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Oh uh -huh. 
So we've come to a time in our worship where we're going to commune together. And it's kind of strange to do this maybe on a video in your home as we're waiting for things to hopefully return back to a normal state where we can be together all in one room. And I wanted to commune today with you and with my dear brother Richard. And Richard, as we begin to consider the bread and the cup, I wanted to ask you if you'd share Maybe one passage or one thought from Scripture that makes communion very personal for you. Well, this may seem unusual for some. Usually when we're thinking of communion, it's about, of course, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, which it centers around that. But what woke me up about, maybe it was 10, 15 years ago, there's something more personal to me about this that I need to prepare for when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 that I need to examine my life. I need to examine myself. So all of a sudden it did become personal because when I take communion, I can either take it in a way to glorify God or bring judgment on myself. Mm -hmm. So I started taking it a little more personal mm -hmm. and start thinking before Sunday uh, before that time we take communion, what is my life like? Has my life glorified God? Has it given mm -hmm. praise to him? Or do I need to repent? Do I need to confess? Do I need to talk to brother or sister? Do, do I need to make things right? And I want to do that, that's beautiful. you know, because I'm saved, right? Yes. And to save, yes. do that. So that's just made it a little more personal to me, Anthony. You consider how you honor the death that he gave for you yeah. in your life. And I appreciate that. So let's pray together and thank God for the body of Jesus Christ that was given for us. Um, let's commune in his body together and think about that right. and be reflective on ourselves. So let's pray. Father... I just want to thank you for your plan that from the very beginning you knew that you wanted to deliver us, that you knew you'd have to be there and out of a father's love you chose to do whatever it took and you did that through your son Jesus. And it's his body that was willingly laid down for us, that restores us, that frees us. And help us now as we commune, help us to be reflective on the way that we do or do not bring honor to you. Help us to reflect on the way that we glorify you. 
And help us, God, to reconcile. If that's with you first, let us reconcile. If it's with a brother or sister in Christ, give us the humility and love that Jesus had as we take this bread, remind us of his humility and his love for us to be willing to reconcile. And Father, may we really have a communion together with you and Jesus. We pray, amen. Amen. All right, boy, I'm glad we can share in these things together, Anthony. But uh, what I learned in the last couple of weeks, I, I, I fell here a couple weeks ago, and my children started this oh, stuff. Man. You know, you're getting old, and you need yep, to hear that. So <laughs> what I thought about is what goes around comes around. That's not what I actually said to my doctor when I went in last <laughs> week. So what goes around comes around. You asked me what made it meaningful to me, and sure. I'm going to ask you the same thing. What, what makes taking the Lord's Supper alive for you? What makes it very, very personal, other than just saying you're, you're celebrating or you're praising yeah. God. So the passage that we are so, could be so familiar with in Matthew 26, where Jesus talks about taking the bread with his disciples and he breaks it and he says, this is my body. And then he moves to the cup and he says, take this, all of you. This is representing the blood of the new covenant. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget where I was sitting and uh, what I was wearing when I heard a gentleman teach that passage. And he said, you know, as you take the bread and you drink the cup and it's the Lord's body and it's the blood of the covenant, there's a moment that you need to honor and remember what he has done for you. But then don't forget to take one next step, which is as a Christian, I'm part of the body of Christ. So as I take the bread, remember that body was broken for me. Am I willing to lay down my life for the body, the other members of the church? You know that I'm part of. So, so are you saying that you know the body well enough to do that? I mean, isn't yes, that to, part to, of it? To be the woven fellowship? into the intimacy of the body that I am here with locally. Mm -hmm. And then as I take the cup, he says, this blood is for the new covenant. That covenant is a marriage word, which means there's two people in that relationship. I honor Jesus for what he did for me and his forgiveness. But I also need to ask myself, um, am I living up to that covenant? Mm -hmm. Am I faithful to him? So, Am I committed to him? So that's then again, examining yourself. The, absolutely. It's, uh, we didn't plan this, but I love right. how they work together because, you know, you think about any relationship, the amount of effort you put into growing it and developing it is what's going to yield its fruit. And if I don't do that with Christ, I'm not going to have a Does that then make it more personal to you when you, when Christ is on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them, those that nailed him to the cross, for they know not what they do. They just don't know. And... This is what leads us back to just not only being grateful for what his body and his blood did for us, mm -hmm. but asking myself, okay, how do I now participate, partake in that? Because I'm part of the body and I'm in the covenant too. Well, that's great. Well, why don't we take this opportunity to give thanks for the, the yes, fruit of the vine, uh, if you don't mind, and, and think about the things that you've you shared with us. Holy Father in heaven, grateful we are that you love us and, and you care for us. You've given us your mercy and your grace and how grateful we are that we can be together at this time and, and think about your son on the cross and, and think about his blood shed and, and about uh, the, the, the minute that he said, it's finished. Amen. And then he resurrected triumphantly from the grave. Amen. We thank you and we praise you for that. We also thank you, Father, that, that we come to you as individuals and as wanting to serve you. And as Anthony said, wanting to actually... Um, well, what he said, actually know one another and be willing to sacrifice for mm -hmm. one another and be willing to, to forgive one another and be willing to, mm -hmm. to love each other deeply. So as we fellowship together in this, uh, passing this as fruit of the vine, Father, pray that you'll, you'll bless us as we examine our hearts and as we give praise to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the blessing of being your children. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Oh, oh, oh.
acceptable gift that we ever give God is the one that we give when we rejoice. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7, he says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. There is no doubt that the way that we give brings good to the work of the church, possibly the poor or the sick, but the reality is it's twice as good for those of us who participate in giving, we're the ones who are blessed. It's sort of like a flower that pours forth its beautiful smell because it never dreamed of doing anything different. Or like a bird that gives us its song because it's a bird and that's what it finds pleasure in doing. Or the sunshine that just not by compulsion, but by just being the sun gives its rays. The thing that allows us to return to the spirit of being a giver like God is the grace that he has given us. It is the grace of God, the overwhelming abundance of his grace, that unlocks our spirit of generosity and brings us the joy that we get to have because we're participating with God in his ministry of giving. Let's thank God for the opportunity to be restored to our purpose and live the life we were designed to live. God, we are so grateful that you bless us over and over, and you never stop blessing. Help us to have eyes to see all the grace that you shower upon us. And out of that grace, God, would you help us to awaken to the spirit of generosity we were designed to have. And as we awaken to that spirit of generosity, God, give us the joy that comes by being people who give. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways. And step by step you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. When you were a little child, did you ever sing the song, Jesus Loves the Little Children, All the Children of the World? I used to love that song. It's so rich, too. It's so true. Jesus had a fondness for children. He welcomed them around him in his ministry. Even when some were trying to keep them away from him, he wanted them to be around him. He blessed them freely. He'd had them on his lap. And he taught some pretty good lessons using children as illustrations. I want to talk to you today about one of the great biblical paradoxes. You're probably familiar with a few of them already, like we must die with Christ in order to live. Uh, We must become poor in spirit in order to be rich. 
Well, here's one of the most difficult of Jesus' teachings, I think. In order to become spiritually mature, he said we must return to the humble state of a little child. Not a teenager, not even an adolescent, but the word Jesus uses in Matthew 18, in the first few verses, is a little toddler. Now, we try to hang on to our childhood in a lot of ways, don't we? And sometimes we're pretty good at it. Uh, for example, when we got some snow earlier this winter, I went sledding with my grown daughter. It was really fun, brought back some great memories, both her and me. I considered it a success. I felt like a little child. Uh, although I don't remember being sore for a couple days after I was sled riding at age five, um, but I must have been. I'm sure I was. And, and then there are some childlike things we don't easily attain again, like hair growth or lots of energy after five o'clock. Okay, lots of energy in general. Uh, but here in Matthew 18, Jesus calls all disciples to become like a little child by humbling themselves. And he made it an imperative because he believes that we can do it if we decide to do it. Let's read Matthew 18 verses 1 through 5 together, and then we'll make some references to a few more verses down through the chapter. Matthew 18, 1 through 5 says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Doesn't this conjure up a beautiful image in your mind of this setting? Jesus has just sent Peter fishing for tax money and comes back and he's in their presence again and the disciples come to him and ask who is the greatest. He calls for a little child to come to him and stands him in their midst for an object lesson. And he tells them they must become like this little child if they're going to enter the kingdom. In Luke 18, we read of parents who want to bring their infants to him to touch and bless. And when the disciples tried to forbid them, Jesus told the disciples, let the little children come to me and don't forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, the kingdom of heaven consists not only of little children, but of adults who are like little children. He wanted them to get used to receiving children. But we have a great misunderstanding about what greatness is. You see, the question was, who will be greatest in the kingdom? The tragedy of adulthood is that there is in adults a false understanding of greatness so often and a desire to attain it. And it begins in childhood. Children learn what the world calls greatness by observing people in high places who use their platforms to influence. They also learn to esteem what their parents esteem. Ooh. And so a child's idea of greatness is shaped by what they see. And if it's pomp and pride, if it's power and popularity, that's what they'll pursue. There's a strong pull to have power. You get your way. It was everybody's dilemma in Lord of the Rings, right? And there's a strong sense of security found in popularity. You feel accepted. That was Olivia Newton-John's problem in Greece, not the country, right? And there's a strong attraction to pomp, you know, swag. It's kind of cool. So as children grow, they begin to value these things, things which can in no way bring contentment or peace or joy or hope. Our deep desire to know God and be known by Him, to forgive and be forgiven, to love and be loved can only be found in Jesus and the gospel. We were made to worship God. And when Jesus was healing people in the temple in his final days, the little children were singing perfect praise to him. And when they said, do you hear what, he's, what these children are saying? Jesus said, have you not read from the Psalms that, that little children have perfected praise? I love that. But if they learn to worship things other than Jesus, 
it blossoms into idolatry. Being misdirected about what greatness is eventually leads a youth to wrong conclusions and wrong actions as adults. Soon enough, what power, popularity, and pleasure have promised a young person turns to pain, wounds, and burns. And in adulthood, maybe even sooner, the sting of sin brings anger and fear. And so many live their adult lives in a cycle that never ends. They just keep taking more and greater doses of this devil's Kool-Aid of what greatness is and how you attain it. Once innocent children wind up broken and lost, but God's greatness gets clouded over. His love becomes obscure. His redemption seems unattainable. And little children, like kittens, grow up into cats. No offense for you cat lovers. Jesus is the only one qualified to say, humble yourselves and become like a little child because he humbled himself to the point of obedience, even unto death. If he says in order for us to be mature adults, we need to put on our best toddler, then we need to figure it out and get to it. So if we want greatness, there's got to be a return to childhood. In verses two through four, Jesus said you need to change your direction. You need to turn. Turn around and go back. Turn around and go back to the purest state of innocence found in those little children and take on the nature of a little child. If we're truly seeking the kingdom of heaven and the only way to get into it is through complete surrender and becoming like a little child again, then we need to stop worrying so much about geriatrics. You know, when we get older, what's gonna happen? And we need to concern ourselves more with pediatrics. How can I become like a little child? He said, if you wanna be great, look at this little child. That's greatness. So what's great about a child? In verse four, Jesus said this, therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Little children are humble. They are positioned under the authority of their parents and obey them. I know some of you are thinking like I did when I read this, that if I were standing there with my family, and Jesus needed to call on a child for an example, he'd probably looked at my family and went, um, yes, how about the child in the back? <laughs> we don't feel like our children are humble sometimes. Uh, they, they, as they grow older, they're more challenging. Um, they want to take more control. But remember, this is a, a little toddler, and they do well to obey. Uh, they follow their parents and obey their parents pretty well, at least enough for him to make the point. And so, we need to learn obedience again, just, just humble obedience to God. Also, humility is not just when someone does a nice thing for someone else, but it's an understanding that you're below someone. In fact, that you're below everyone else, that you're willing to place yourself in a position of servant to all. That's why Jesus tells grownups, who are no longer under the authority of their parents to learn to humble themselves and become like little children again. It's a conscientious decision that we have to make to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. Remember Mark 8? To place yourself below King Jesus and below all others to serve. Now we can skim through the rest of the chapter, Matthew chapter 18, and see a few other things that humble adults do. In verse five, adult believers must receive one another as little children do. Paul told us to do the same in Romans 15, six and seven, when he said, therefore receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. And do it so that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it brings God glory when we receive one another as little children do. Have you ever watched a group of children play on a playground, many of whom don't know each other? And yet they don't look at all their differences. They don't see color. They're not really worried about what they're wearing, uh, what brand of clothing they have on. They're just having fun and they're having fun that everybody else is having fun. Oh yeah, they might fight over who's first to get down the slide a little bit but generally they just don't worry about their differences. 
He wants us to focus on our likenesses. And in him, we all have come under one faith and we're learning one mind and one heart together. We're learning to be like Jesus. Of course, we all have different personalities. We all have baggage. We have lots of quirks. All of us do. But think pediatrics, like children on the playground. What are you most concerned with? How different everyone is from you or how we're alike and how we've been brought together and united uh, through the Holy Spirit in Jesus. You know, what unites us is where we're going and what we're trying to become. Receive other believers from all walks of life. And Jesus said in verses 6 through 11, by no means offend one because he came to save those who were lost. And he said also in, in verse 14, that it's not the will of our Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. He's talking about other adult believers who have become like children to follow him, that we should be careful to receive each other and not to offend one another because he came to save the lost. Let's make sure that we don't get someone lost. Another way we see the humility of a little child is in verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, Jesus said, so now you're the offended. What are you going to do about it? The childlike Christian has a heart that's willing to forgive. This is the opposite of losing somebody. This is repairing a bridge in order to keep somebody from being banished to the other side. Children are quick to forgive. Sometimes they're greatly wronged, and yet they trust adults. They trust their parents. And they're willing to give themselves to them again in obedience. And we need to be like a child when it comes to forgiving one another. Jesus said he'd be right in the midst of us if we tried to make things right with our brother or sister and to explain their fault. And their fault is something truly that is a sin against us. It's not just that they hurt our feelings. It's not just that uh, they have a different personality than us that we're not used to. It's not just uh, that we're annoyed with them. Um, those things we need to learn to bear with, but this is if they've truly faulted you. Peter came to him then in verse 21 and asked him, Lord, how many times shall we forgive our brother? Up to seven times? And Jesus said, no, but seven times 70. That's his rule for us. And that's what he wants us to practice toward others. That's pediatrics. How diligent little children are to move past the faults and keep playing together. We big people should take notes from them on how to repair bridges and stay together. Well, there are other things too about little children that we could probably draw upon that would make sense, like their spongy minds that learn so well and their propensity to believe things without having to see them. But in this context, in Matthew 18, Jesus focused on their humility and how they receive one another and forgive one another. One of the greatest examples of childlike humility in Scripture that I've found comes from one of the most unlikely people. And it happened in this very same town of Capernaum earlier in Jesus' ministry. The Roman centurion that you can read about in Matthew 8 was very much an adult man. Jesus marveled at him and remained perplexed by the pride of his own people. How about you? Would he be marveling at your childlike humility or would he be perplexed at you does he still see an adult full of fear and anger searching for fulfillment in the things of the world burning bridges where you go or does he see a humble child who knows their place in the world who builds bridges and serves all and is content in christ alone i hope he sees someone that is moving toward childlike humility in you. That's what we all need to work toward. It's one of the great paradoxes of the faith. And there's only one man that can take us there. And that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus. That's why he said, follow me. We imitate him as our master. And we see in him a man of great strength, but we also see his childlike humility, which is what actually 
gives him his strength and power. It's what makes him great. It's why we adore him and worship him. And so if you want to become great in the kingdom of Christ, in fact, yes, to enter into the kingdom and remain in God's good graces, you need to learn how to be childlike in this way. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. Hey, thanks for tuning in today, and thanks for joining us in our in our worship service. We uh, we hope you have received great benefit from it, and we uh, would like to close in prayer at this time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for the, for the day that you provided for us and the many blessings and, and opportunities that we have. Father, we just ask you to be with us as we go through our week, that, that we may take the things that we've learned today and apply them to our lives, and be with us and keep us safe. For this is our prayer through your Son, Jesus' name. Amen.